Ontario. It's a pleasure to invite you here from Grand Marais area. Sailor that you are. Two harbors. Two harbors. Yes. Sailor that you are. Yes. <laughs> um, thanks everybody for coming tonight and thank Indivisible for putting this together and inviting the community to our church basement. There are bathrooms in the back, two of them, and one upstairs in case you need one. Just that's a little housekeeping. Uh, there's plenty of cookies and coffee and tea back there, and um, there's also a basket that says free will offering, and it's not for our church, it's for <laughs> future programs put on by Invisible. So if you feel so inclined, feel free to throw some greenbacks in there if you would, please. The uh, program tonight, uh, there's something that I was given this, just before program by a wise man that he got in a uh, Chinese restaurant <laughs> and an in fortune cookie and it says it says this better to understand little than to misunderstand a lot <laughs> that seems to fit with the topic tonight I think really well so uh, so yeah, here, Gordon. We're happy that you're here, and I'll shut up now. And uh, oh, I just want to mention too that there's some of her books back there, which are really cool, and a bunch of takeout papers that you can have. And if you want to write on something, there's paper back there you can write on. Yeah. If you need some pencils, there's some in the back that uh, we have there. So, welcome and thank you for coming. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I have to say I have a very special affinity for this little family right here because we used to always bring our daughters to events like this, and we were always the only ones. So here you are. All right. Once again, thank you for having me. I'm Katya Gordon. I am uh, from Two Harbors, Minnesota. And I'm just a, just a, for the full disclaimer, so I'm a volunteer like you. And um, this is one of the ways that I have learn how to get outside of my comfort zone, and I've learned a lot and I try to share it. Um, but I'm not an expert in any way, and so um, this will be a free-flowing presentation. You're free to ask questions. You're also free to just take it all in, and then at the end we can have questions too. All right, so this is our sailboat. It's a 40-foot steel cutter rig sailboat that we sail on Lake Superior and have sailed beyond. And in order for me to really explain to you um, where I'm coming from and what my story is, I have to give you a little background. So here's a little background. Um, as Well, before I do the background, I'm going to do the foreground. So what we did about five years ago as a family is we discovered the Citizens Climate Lobby, which has a mission of a livable world. And to us, that just felt really meaningful. It's like not a perfect world, a livable world. And um, so we latched on to this, um, but how did we get to the point where we were part of the Citizens Climate Lobby? Let me tell you our story. Oh, first I'm going to tell you the mission. We create the political will for climate solutions by enabling individual breakthroughs and in personal and political power. So there's a very specific goal that we work toward, but we do it in all different ways. And the way I do it is by one way is by these presentations. So, how did we start? So our story began, my husband Mark and I um, bought this steel, another smaller boat um, about 20 years ago. And I don't know if you guys know Lake Superior very well, but that's a sleeping giant uh, by Thunder Bay. And we sailed it around Lake Superior when our girls were zero and two. And that was really the first major adventure. We came, Mark and I both had a history of adventuring, leading teenagers on canoe trips and backpacking trips and climbing and stuff. So it was um, just a small leap for us to get on a sailboat and have our own children and start doing adventures in that way. Um, after our trip around the lake, which took about three months, we sold everything and we moved aboard our boat nine months later and we sailed down to the Bahamas. And so we really do have, um, this, is, this is really the paradigm I come from, is we're a sailing family. And our sailboat really honed, it really brought us the values that we have today as a family, which are about being together and about really trying to have our priorities drive our lifestyle rather than have our lifestyle drive our priorities. 
And just in case you think sailing with a small family in the Caribbean is all peaches and cream, um, this is just one day in the Caribbean. We had these fronts coming through all the time, and as you can imagine, there's Mark at the bow. He's too nervous to leave. He has to watch the anchor to make sure we don't drag. And so sailing um, does have many highs and lows and stresses, uh, just like living on land. Uh, but it does have some precious things that we were reluctant to give up. When we came back from that trip, we moved to Two Harbors because that's where we had jobs. And we lived as regular people for a couple years. Uh, but we found that we were kind of losing ground. We were losing some of the things that were really important to us, including um, the togetherness and this life of simplicity. So we decided to change gears again. And this time we were going to buy a bigger boat and we are going to take people sailing for our livelihood. And so that's what we did. And we called this, we bought this boat, which is the one we have now. And we started Amicus Adventure Sailing where we take people sailing on Lake Superior. So that's sort of chapter one of our story. In 2012, now the girls are eight and 10, we decided to live aboard for a year again. But this time we were gonna have young adults living with us. And this trip, um, you see, so these two, Emma and Will, they sailed with us from um, Duluth through all the way to North Carolina. It took about uh, six weeks. And at the end of that, they were with us in what turned out to be Hurricane Sandy. And hurricanes, now this picture, if you look at where we are, if you could look through those clouds, you'd see that um, we're actually anchored in a river. So we're not out on the ocean there. And in fact, we left New York City, what turned out to be the last weather window to leave New York. Of course, we didn't know it at the time, but had we not taken that weather window, we probably would have lost our boat because as you know, Hurricane Sandy hit New York City really hard and because of the combination of the tide, the storm, and the uh, water level, it destroyed you know, virtually every sailboat within 100 miles of there. So we were really lucky. Um, what we did was we sailed down to North Carolina, started to hear about a huge storm coming. So we went north, and then we went south, and then it seemed like that was too far. So we ended up anchoring in the Pasquotank River in North Carolina and sat there for about a week and had a pretty uneventful, safe Hurricane Sandy. But that experience really changed us, and that, I feel like, is where we really became more aware of and sort of, that's when climate change really took hold for us. Um, it was immediate, it was very real, and it wasn't anything about the future anymore. And after that, um, it seemed like we were experiencing what we heard about, which is unfamiliar weather patterns, less predictability, and more extreme storms. So we had, you know, the, basically the biggest storm ever recorded, and then it was supposed to begin hurricane season, so traditionally sailboats could sail down to the Caribbean now, but the meteorologists were just, you could hear in their voice, they just didn't know what was gonna happen. It was, even though it was mid-November, there were still big tropical things happening. So we changed our plans, and we went to Bahamas again, where we'd been the year before. But all the way down the coast, we witnessed the after effects of Hurricane Sandy. And sometimes I think here in the Midwest, we really are kind of shielded from these more stark uh, climate change events. And I, we have climate change, which we'll get to that part, but um, it was really something for us to see entire towns that were underwater and also to see um, brand new buildings, like a brand new school that had been abandoned after one year because uh, it flooded, it was predicted to flood the next year and the next year, and they quickly realized, why did we even build this school? So things like that had a huge effect on us. We also um, found that, uh, you know, they say crumbling infrastructure. So on the East Coast, what that means is they have a huge uh, waterway system with buoys everywhere, and the buoys were absolutely not meaning anything. And so we could handle that for a first few days after the storm, but we figured a few months after the storm, you know, in solid Minnesota, everything would have been back in place. Well, we tried to come in to a port in Florida. The buoys were not matching, and it was incredibly dangerous because it looked like we were heading straight for these reefs. We called the Coast Guard, and they just told us to go back out. They said, we have no idea. We haven't even looked at those buoys. Um, and then later we learned that about five of our boats had come in, and many five had gone, come to grief in that exact spot. So it really was very dangerous. So all this, like I'm saying, had a big effect on us. 
The other thing that really changed on this second trip down to the Caribbean is um, not that there wasn't plastic the first trip, but the second trip, so this is a beach that's facing the Atlantic. A lot of the beaches face the inland sea in the Caribbean, and those were pretty nice, but anything that faced Europe, Africa, or North America looked like this. And um, if you look there, you can see that, you know, you, pretty much you can walk in your knees up to, up to your knees in what is essentially plastic, which um, even the beaches where the plastic had sort of disintegrated, it was, had just become this sort of fine, um, not even dust, sort of fine stringy material that you just kind of walk through. And that's when we really started to get on the plastic piece, which is a big piece of climate change because it takes so much fossil fuels to make plastic. And then of course, there's no way to get rid of them without creating a lot more fossil fuels. So when we came back from that trip, this is us coming back on the Erie Canal. We had to take down our masks to get into the Great Lakes system. We decided it was time to do something different. So chapter three of our story is when we started Sea Change Expeditions. And this was, um, again, just us saying, what can we do? And this is what I hope you all have done or are doing is um, thinking, what is my niche in this world of climate change? What is the thing that I can do that um, uses my strengths and that is effective, that has something to say. So what we do is we take, uh, as well as our family, we take four young adults every month, every May for a month, and we go sailing around the Superior and we stop at schools along the way and do these events. And um, those are the, several of the routes we've done. We've actually done it for six years now. So we've really been to virtually every port on the lake and we get kids to, we, we do a semblance of this presentation to these, to lots and lots and lots of kids. We have them visit our boat, tour the boat, see our solar panel and our wind, and uh, see that eight people can live in a space the size of a large bathroom. And then we get them signing our map. So we made a map of an old, you can not really see it very well, but it's a map of Lake Superior made from an old sail. And it's the Clean, Cold, and Clear Challenge. And they're not allowed to sign it unless they really mean it. And they really want, they, they will keep the waters of Lake Superior clean, cold, and clear by reducing energy consumption and rethinking use of plastic. So um, this has become something that is um, just really fun and meaningful for us to do. And it really uses both our sailing and our adventure. And um, it really feels like it makes a difference for schools and for a lot of teachers, and I can tell you a lot more about our experiences on Sea Change, but I will say that we also have a teenage trip now that we do in June, and we've never had a kid from International Falls, but I'm hoping um, we're gonna actually go to a school, um, I'm going to a classroom tomorrow to talk about it, and I have brochures, so if anyone wants to, is interested in sailing Lake Superior, we had to do a teen trip in June, and we also now do a teacher trip, because there are so many teachers that say, we need our own trip. Like we need, we need to be inspired about climate change too, and we need to learn how to integrate climate change into our classroom. And uh, we agree, that's all really important. And um, so, what we do with teachers is we um, give, we tell them, or we teach them the things that we've done on Sea Change that bring uh, carbon cutting projects into schools and areas that we've had success. And um, that's been really fun too. So that's an alternative school in Duluth that they all signed the pledge and visited our boat. So now we're gonna move a little bit on to weather and climate. Um, so when we first started Sea Change, we were like, we wanna make sure we are telling the truth, right? We wanna have good information, we wanna make sure it's relevant and it's up to date. So we just started asking around and um, I was a little bit nervous afraid at the beginning because I am not a scientist and I know that some of this stuff can be very complex. And very early on, we were in Hope, Michigan, um, doing a presentation at the library, a public presentation from our boat, and several of the scientists from Michigan Tech were there, and so of course this made me a little bit nervous. Um, and they had been very friendly, but still I was nervous. And so we gave our whole spiel and urged everyone to act on climate and gave them ideas and did lots of science stuff. And afterwards, um, one of the scientists raised his hand and I was like, ah! and I asked him to, 
call on him and he said, I just want to say, it is so important for there to be people like you out there getting this information to the public because we are sitting on so much information and it's not getting to the public. So thank you. So after, since then, I felt like, whew, okay, so we're allowed to speak these things. Um, really, and there's been so many scientists that have come to our presentations and they have all, without exception, given us their blessing. And they can forgive if we make little errors here and there. Um, so here's what I'm going to talk about now. So uh, we all know that weather and climate is different. Uh, generally, a 30-year <coughs> uh, time span is what's considered climate. So um, climate is what happens over at least a period of 30 years. Um, so any, um, so one, one way we have kids think about it is weather is what you get. So what do we get today? We had cloudbursts, we had beautiful skies, we had about 50 degree temperatures. Um, that's our weather. What do we expect? Well, in uh, September and in International Falls, we probably expect you know, certain bugs, certain leaf patterns, certain wave patterns, that what we expect is our climate. What we get is the weather. And um, it's just important to clarify that uh, because it so often happens, you know, they, climate change is a weather exacerbator. So storms might be worse, they might be more intense, um, but it is, you know, often impossible to say, well, this is a climate change only event. Um, but at the same time, we can't say, well, I mean, it's important to not back off that and just say, well, then it has nothing to do, weather and climate have nothing to do with each other because big, there are more events than there used to be and they're more intense. I'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so this is a little video just to show that what we see happening in one part of the world is really different than the others. This is global temperatures from about 1850, no, 1880, sorry, to the present. And this is not how warm or how cold it is, it's how much it's deviating from the norm. So if you see blue, that is colder than long-term average. If you see yellow, that's warmer than long-term average. Red is like way warmer than long-term average. And this is what it looks like. Hopefully I can do this. So if you can't read the years, this is 1900. 1920, 1970, and 1980, 90, 2000, 2018. So I'm just going to let that speak for itself. <clears throat> So what is causing this? Now some people um, think of the, the Earth's atmosphere as part of space. Well, the important thing to know is it's just like a very thin, our atmosphere that's warming is a very thin blanket around the Earth. And it has been compared to an apple peel on the apple. But actually I've heard recently that an apple peel is way thicker than the sphere that we're talking about. So this sphere with our greenhouse gas emissions around the Earth is increasing the CO2 and other greenhouse gas to the point where, and we know just from basic science, we've known since the 1800s that more carbon dioxide in the air means higher temperatures. That's just really basic science. And this kind of just shows how as concentration of carbon goes up, temperature also goes up. This is, this is the line, and this is just sort of a long-term average again, beginning in 1880. So the slides I'm using are a combination of sort of NASA slides, and then there's quite a few amazing scientists and meteorologists in Minnesota, and so I'm using some of their slides too. Um, you've probably heard or know that the Earth has warmed um, many times before. Climate is always changing. So what's different is the degree and the speed to which it's changing. So this shows 
the year 1000, so this is the last thousand years, this has been the degree of variability in our climate. And there's something messed up about my slide. These slides are a little funny because it's working on a different thing. But anyway, what this is supposed to show is that this is where this is going. I don't know if you ever heard of the hockey stick, but a lot of the graphs that describe both, that describe climate change, they look like a hockey stick because as things are pretty normal and then suddenly they go shooting up. And a lot of the shooting up started around the 1980s. Okay, so we know about um, the two degrees. We want to keep the Earth under two degrees Celsius of warming, if at all possible. Um, this shows that um, even given the current INDCs, so this is um, in 2015, so this is a little outdated, but it definitely shows that um, there's nothing about um, what we have done so far that is going to match those, the, the two degree thing. There, there's a disconnect right now between even the Paris Agreement is not going to make the two degree. And the two degrees was really a concession itself because there's widespread agreement that it's really 1.5 degrees that we need to stick under in order to keep a livable world for much of the world near the coast. So, um, so that's that. All right, so let's bring it home a little bit more to Minnesota and Lake Superior. So I live on Lake Superior. We sail on Lake Superior, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Lake Superior. Um, and most of this information is from the Large Lakes Observatory, which is uh, one of the, the biggest, one of the premier um, scientific institutions on large lakes in the world, and it happens to be in Duluth. And um, we get a lot of this information from Jay Austin, who is a scientist there, and he tells us that Lake Superior is warming twice the rate of the air. It has warmed 4.5 degrees Fahrenheit between 1979 and 2006. And we're on the lake all day, so Mark often tells this story. Um, you know, so does anyone know what the long-term average high of Lake Superior is? Or can anyone hazard a guess? Like, how warm does Lake Superior get on the surface, on average, over the long term? 48 degrees. Good guess. It's actually 59 degrees. So who has swum in 60-degree water? Probably everybody. Yes. Good, you're water people, too. Um, so, you know, 60 degrees cold water. So where we live, you know, the old timers, anyone who's lived on that lake their whole life and is over 70 years old, they still just freak out when we talk about swimming on the lake because you don't swim on Lake Superior in their world. Lake Superior is a life-threatening thing. And I noticed um, in the paper a couple years ago there was a kid that had, was in a paddleboard and he drifted out. And a senior in high school, a swim team champion, swam out and got him and brought him back. And it was very heroic and it was wonderful. And what amazed me about the article in the paper was it never once mentioned the temperature of the water, which happened to be in the 70s. Um, so it wasn't really the temperature of the water that was so amazing about this event. So the, my point is, you know, had that article happened 30 years ago, it would have been all about the temperature of the water. Um, and this time, it really, the fact that she went out and swam to this and got and brought the person back um, was a historic event all in itself. So we were out there in 2010, and Mark looked at his thermometer, and four feet under it said 70 degree water. And this was not in a bay, this was not in the shallows, and we've sailed on Lake Superior enough to know that was wild. So he stopped the boat, he directed us all to go swimming, he said, You'll never see this again. Seven degree water, you can swim in Lake Superior. So we all jumped in, and that was 2010. And that was really before our climate radar was very high. So every year since that year, except one, there was that one terrible, terrible winter, the polar vortex winter, where the temperatures did not reach 70 degrees the following summer. But every summer since then, we have had swimmable water in Lake Superior. And not just on the surface, this is a four feet under. And it's gotten to 70, degree, 70 degrees every year, except the one year. So suddenly phrases like, what was once unthinkable becomes commonplace, take a new meaning for us. That's exactly what happened. We really 
Lake Superior, that was unthinkable, and now it's commonplace. And you know, in Two Harbors, where we are, there's a Burlington Bay, and, and everyone goes there and swims now. And it's just really, really different. So, the reason, one main reason Lake Superior is warming so fast is that we have lost about 70% of our ice cover since 1973. So these are two different winters, February 2013 and then 14. And so this shows, Jay Austin is always pounding into my head, he's the scientist, he says, the, um, the reason we're warming so fast is that we're losing ice cover so fast, and it only takes a very small change in temperature for Lake Superior ice to be dramatically different. He, he's surprised by this. He says, you think there would be currents or the temperature of the summer before or wind patterns that would all affect it, but really it's much more about the temperature. And so just with a few degrees change in temperature, which has happened in the Northland, we've lost a dramatic amount of ice, and of course, any winter where we have no ice like this, the heat is being absorbed all winter long, so that makes the water warmer still and less likely that it will ice over the next year. So um, you can imagine how differently this, this is a whole different economic uh, ecosystem for a winter. I mean, this is a dramatic change from this and we're seeing effects in all kinds of things. Of course, the fish, and the food chain of Lake Superior is changing, as well as all the coastline um, habitat. And then I could also talk about water levels. Uh, people are always interested in water level. Um, the main thing I understand about water level of all the Great Lakes is that it has always operated under a certain hydraulic cycle that goes, there's an average, and then there's, it goes about three feet above and three feet below, and it kind of stays in that in a predictable pattern over the decades. And that pattern has been disrupted, and they don't really know um, what it will lead to, but a few years ago we were at record lows, and right now we're at record highs, so it's the highest it's ever been on record. Um, and we really noticed that we had a couple northeast gales, one last spring and one the fall before, and we get northeast gales on Lake Superior, that's part of our life, right? But with extremely high water, these northeast gales um, destroyed the docks of our Knife River Marina, and so we, we really have experienced climate change firsthand in that way also, the, the crumbling infrastructure. Okay, so in the Northland, we are not necessarily getting hot, like unbearably hot, like other parts of the world, right? We're too far north. So um, there's a couple things to keep in mind. Climate change is more dramatic the closer you get to the poles. So we're farther north, so we have more climate change. They're also, it's also more extreme in the winter than the summer, and it's more extreme at night than in the day. So what's warming fastest is our winter nights. And for those of you that have lived here forever, I bet you that rings a bell to you because um, the, the deep winter cold nights that used to be commonplace have really, really diminished over the last decade, much more than our summer highs, for instance, which are actually not changing that dramatically, although they are predicted to start changing more dramatically in the coming decades. But um, the way, one way that we are experiencing climate change in northern Minnesota is the lack of the hard winter and particularly the hard winter nights. So this should, this graph, uh, this comes from Kenny Blumenfeld who is a very funny meteorologist in Minnesota. If you ever want to read a funny blog about weather, you should look him up. Um, but he generously let me use all these slides. He has a ton of slides, um, but I'll spare you most of them. But anyway, um, so this measures how, how heavy, so he called the 10 degree winter, so that's when temperatures are at or below 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so deep winter. And you see the, the dark blue is from 1959 to 1978, so this period would start from around the 24th of December and go to about February 10th. Um, but then you see the light color, 1979 to 1998, is you see a shorter deep, deep winter, and then he says, where did the 10 degree season go? Because the white is 1999 to 2018. Well, actually it 
hardly even exists, and they had to sort of go below zero in order to show where the deep winter is. So, um, winter is a huge part of climate change in Minnesota, which makes leads to the obvious question: Is winter worth saving? And I really believe. I mean, probably I don't know any of you here personally, but. I bet you are winter people because here you are. And um, I feel like it's always been, a, I moved to Minnesota in 1991 and was absolutely enchanted by the fact that people love winter here. They know how to get outside. And where I came from, everyone goes inside in winter and it freezes when they go into the car all the time and that's the only way they know winter. So for me, this is a huge deal. I, I am, um, I really want our daughters to be able to ski through their lifetime. Um, we already have trouble with our ski team because uh, we're so close to the lake and the lake is so warm. And so we really often get rain even up to Christmas. And so this is a very relevant question for me and I hope it is for you too. Another piece of climate change is, some people think it should actually be called climate disruption. And um, when we see these unpredictable weather patterns, I don't know if you remember, but uh, pretty recently it was snowing in Florida while well, it was 50 degrees in Alaska. And just sort of these weird weather, um, a lot of that has to do with the position of the jet stream, which as you probably know is a wind pattern flowing over us. And in normal times, the jet stream flows approximately over Minnesota, which incidentally is why um, we have amazing winds aloft here, and we are predicted to have some of the best wind in the world. We actually have enough wind in northern Minnesota and North Dakota to apparently like, provide energy for the world. That's how much wind there is up there if we use those super high turbines. Um, but anyway, the jet stream, um, because the Arctic is warming faster than the tropics, so this jet stream is like a river. And uh, the top coast of the river is along the Arctic, and the bottom coast is close to the tropics. When the, um, <clears throat> when the Arctic warms faster, the differential is less, and so the jet stream starts to wobble. Its edges are not clear anymore. And so here you see where you have, if the jet stream shoots way down here, we in Minnesota are getting well, something straight from the Arctic, that would be our polar vortex. Well, meanwhile, Alaska, is having record warm temperatures. And it really is a lot about where the jet stream is. Um, so I just try to explain it with that slide. Also, events. So um, we get more one inch rainfalls, more rainfall. Uh, we, the question is, is Minnesota getting wetter or drier? And it's um, overall, it is getting wetter. But the main thing that's happening is that our weather is coming in more um, heavy weather events. So less general, just sort of regular rainfall and more, more of our moisture is coming in these big heavy weather events. But you see that, so one inch rains, which is a, a solid rain, isn't changing that much. So these are two inch rains by a year. So this is how many two inch rainfalls fell in Minnesota. And this is three inch rainfalls, which you see it's becoming a sharper curve and then the four inch rainfalls um, is also increasing pretty dramatically if you take into account that last year, which was 2015. So what does that look like? Floods. So um, when we sound like Superior, we show these slides. Um, these are all coastline communities that have been affected by floods. Um, and you know, we hear a lot about the sea level flooding, but uh, Minnesota is actually one of the most dramatically affected by um, the costs of flooding of other states. So these are all just in the last year, believe it or not. Um, this was the 2012 flood in Duluth, and you probably can't read this, but it says homeowners insurance rates increased 286% between 1998 and 2011, and in 1998, Minnesota insurance companies paid out 1.5 billion in damages, which was more than the previous 40 years combined. So, <laughs> so Minnesota is paying a high price right now for climate change in this way. And it's really important when we talk about climate change to realize it's not a matter of doing nothing. 
or paying a bunch of money and solving our problem. It's, it's, we are paying for this one way or another, and depending on how we pay for it is going to um, have a huge effect on what happens next. Ironically, we also have worse droughts, um, and that's because um, with the extreme heavy weather events also come extreme droughts, the weather patterns get more stuck. Um, and so droughts, of course, lead to fire. We all hear about the fires in California, but there are also huge fires. I, I, I doubt this is news to you because I know that you get a lot of the air from Alberta and Ontario fires. Um, this was a fire in 2016 that happened in May in northern Alberta and uh, in a city the size of Duluth that had to evacuate. So I was telling you about how winter nights are warming the fastest of anything. And one immediate effect that has is invasive species because the boreal forest is essentially the boreal forest because of our deep winter nights. And a lot of these um, pests need negative 40 or below in order to stay out. In fact, I just heard this um, year that we did have, I don't know about you guys up here, but we had a few 40 below nights which was a great relief because the emerald ash borer has now been um, held off, apparently, for another few years. Um, I know in the Twin Cities, they're actually cutting down elm trees now. So sad, they're cutting down trees everywhere. You're from the cities, maybe you've seen this. Um, in order to try to head off this emerald ash borer pestilence. Um, and then, you, do you know, anyone know what this is? Yeah, so the sea lamprey, um, yes, it was. They finally found a an, an, uh, sea lamprey side in, I think, the 1950s, and um, the trout in Lake Superior has been being restored ever since. What people don't necessarily realize is that we have not, um, we have not conquered the sea lamprey, and that they spawn every year. And there are two problems right now. One is that funding is being dropped for um, the lamprey side, so. Um, if we lose enough money, we're not going to be able to kill the lamp sea lamprey when they're spawning. Second is with the warming Great Lakes temperatures, the spawning season for them is growing. So the sea lamprey may come back. And of course, the ticks. Um, do you have ticks up here yet? Oh, no. You do, okay. Yeah, well, so where I was, when I grew up in Philadelphia, you know, that was all about the ticks. But Minnesota didn't have any until I don't know how many, maybe 10 years ago. We, we have some uh, friends who are vets, and they say um, they can pinpoint the year that they first started to have ticks. And now, of course, Lyme disease is a major thing in Minnesota. And there are a lot of other invasive species that... Um, Blue-green algae first appeared on Lake Superior after the Duluth flood of 2012. And um, you can see what a terrible problem it is. There's so many problems happening in the Great Lakes. I, there's a book that I highly recommend. It's called The Death and Life of the Great Lakes. And it reads like a mystery novel, but it's all amazing. It's just the story of the Great Lakes. And one theme that I got from it is that Lake Superior, we are so lucky so far. but. We have problems, but nothing like the other Great Lakes, and that is all reliant on the lake staying cold. Anyway, there is a moose tick issue. So moose are most happy at 50 degrees or below. They're quite happy. They don't need to do anything to warm up unless it gets below 20 below. So moose are in great distress right now in Minnesota, exacerbated by these moose ticks which um, moose ticks used to last only a year because when they drop, they drop off to have their young, I guess, in April. And if they fall into the snow, then they pretty much die out for the year. But if they fall in the grass, then they reproduce year after year. So we're having more of them, more April grass rather than snow. And so we're having, um, so this, there's been 47,000 Moose ticks found on a baby moose and 80,000 to 100,000 on adults. And um, it's really, I mean, there are now documented cases of moose ticks, of moose dying purely from being pretty much destroyed by ticks. I don't know what that was. Okay. 
Oh, so this is just kind of what I already mentioned. Um, the cost, uh, you know, <laughs> one thing that um, has often been, uh, when we talk about climate change solutions, um, if they come from government, people don't like government. And I understand that. I don't like government necessarily either. Um, but one thing they don't realize is that disaster relief has become so high that, you know, we are going to be spending many cents on every dollar that we ever make with disaster relief, and that's all government intervention money. So the cost of catastrophes, if we do not reduce our emissions seriously, is is going to be way more than the cost of actually doing something about climate change. Oops, that's another funny slide. Okay, so now I'm going to get into solutions. And um, people always, you know, you don't want to, this could be a very overwhelming problem. The thing is, we all know what we need to do. The solutions are out there, and it's a matter of learning what they are and then galvanizing ourselves, our communities, and our nation to do them. That's really all it's gonna take. So there's a technological piece, there's a personal piece, and a policy piece. So the personal piece, I suspect since you're here, and I bet you're concerned about climate change, that you are already doing some of these things but they could be anything from um, the huge march that the kids did, four million youth around the world um, marched for climate on Friday, um, transportation, gas, food, to everything, recycling, you all know what these are, I'm not gonna go into them now, personal choices, habits, and lifestyle. Technology, you may know that things are changing, I hope you know that they're changing this fast. Um, Wind and solar are cheaper right now than coal and cheaper than natural gas. And it's really just a matter of utilities understanding this and um, uncommitting to the coal plants that they have. Every What, what is the utility up here? Is it Minnesota Power? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we're Minnesota Power too. So um, one thing that is going to be very important to do now or in the next few years is to really um, understand what Minnesota Power is offering and to also really realize that as a consumer of Minnesota Power, um, we need to have some choices and um, we need to be active consumers. But there still is this policy problem because um, we know from data that it's as easy for a child to see as an adult that we are not changing fast enough in order to solve the problem as it needs to be solved. We have a short number of years before um, the, the, the cycles start to take over and it really becomes hard to reverse anything. So, our carbon emissions problem represents a massive market, massive market failure, and I'm an economist by education, so this stuff really rings to me. Um, if it doesn't ring to you, I hope that you can learn at least a few, the basic idea. We do live in a market economy here in the United States, and that's not something that's going to change anytime soon. But the cost of carbon emissions is not included in the price we pay for fossil fuels. That's why we need to price carbon. So what kind of policy would be a good policy? And when, I, when we started to work with the Citizens Climate Lobby, we, <coughs> excuse me, we did the research um, and found that they had discovered a policy where climate scientists and climate economists agreed that we needed to have come up with a policy that would be fair, beneficial for all, it would be over the whole economy, it would be effective, it would actually work, it would be market driven, it would be national in scope, and it would have international reach because, of course, we in the United States have the dubious joy of being leaders around the world in many ways, so what we do really is going to matter around the world. So a while ago, this is an idea that actually began with um, Ronald Reagan's chief economic advisor, George Schultz, and has been also, uh, Nobel laureate Gary Becker also came up with this. So this is a very old idea. And the idea is to price carbon at its source in a steadily rising fee and then give all the money back. So in other words, um, oops. You don't have to just 
click it off. Click it? I mean, put the, the cursor over on that and get rid of it. Yeah. There you go. Good thing I got my picky guy. One down, one down in the corner. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so carbon fee dividend. What is it? Oops. Another funny slide. So, for many, many years, we were talking about carbon fee dividend as an idea. It's the idea of taxing carbon, but then rather than adding to the government coffers and then arguing about what to do with all that money, we would just return it all to U.S. households. And so this is an idea that has bipartisan support because it has bipartisan values. And um, conservatives generally really like that it doesn't grow government and that it, it's, it acts like a tax break. Liberals really like it because it is an equalizing thing because over, basically more than 50% of Americans would stand to get back more in their dividend than they would pay in the higher prices. And this is a little bit hard to understand, so I'm gonna take several slides to try to explain it. This one doesn't explain it very well, but there's a carbon fee, so, at the, so it's not like you would pay a fee at the pump. It's like um, where, that, where the carbon comes out of the ground, the fossil fuel company, they already record how much, how much carbon is coming out of the ground, so they pay a fee on that. And um, the bill that is now in Congress says that it starts at $15 a ton and then rises $10 a ton every year after that for a certain number of years. And all that money is placed in a separate treasury and then um, returned to U.S. households, sort of like our Social Security checks, a lot like the Alaskan oil dividends. It's a, it's a very simple and transparent process. And it can happen tomorrow. It's, it's incredibly simple. This is good for people because it reduces emissions and it's fair. Um, it's bipartisan. It is revenue neutral. That means the government does not take in any revenue from this. There's a tiny administrative fee. They've actually commissioned a lifelong person who worked at the U.S. Treasury. To, they said, if we were to have this, what would it look like? And he devised a system, a simple system to make it work that show that, yes, there is an administrative fee, but it's very tiny. Um, it's actually very much more, it's more effective in reducing emissions than any cap and trade um, bill. So we are very, very excited after about eight, nine, 10 years of lobbying Congress and building relationships with our elected officials on both sides of the aisle, we actually have a bipartisan climate bill. It's the only bipartisan climate bill of its kind and it is now working its way through the House, and we're very excited about this, and we, I hope you get excited too. Why price carbon at the point of extraction? Why not at the pump? Well, mostly because it's simple and can be set up quickly. Like I said, this is our, this is, there's not, they wouldn't even have to hire a new person to figure this out. This is all already established. It's also fair because every sector of the economy is engaged. There's no winners and losers that the government picks. There's no regulation. Uh, it's just simply the market decides. And I, this is the part I think is so important because I just think we deserve to know where we're using fossil fuels and how will we know if it's not priced. How do we know how much carbon is in this table or in this projector or in the hamburger you're eating at the restaurant? The only way we can find that out is by pricing carbon and seeing what happens with prices. Uh, we might be surprised, I think in some ways. Um, the other reason to do it is because it's transparent and it's stable and anything that's uh, so simple and stable um, can be done quickly. Why be revenue neutral? Well, because politicians like it. It protects low and middle income Americans. Government is not picking winners. The low carbon solutions are the only winners. The other uh, test for this is does it work? And this just um, there have been a very thorough economic study done by, it's called REMI, it's a, um, they do economic analyses for all, you know, across the political spectrum so everyone can trust it, and um, it has shown unequivocally that it would reduce emissions, emissions and also that it grows, you know, millions of jobs in the economy. Uh, that slide didn't work. And sometimes people say, well, what would this actually look like? Well, the first year, 
the $15 a ton fee would be about the equivalent of 15 cents per gallon of gas. So instantly your gas would go up about 15 cents a gallon, which to me compared to the four, three or four dollar shifts we see when we have no control over what's happening across the world um, is a small price to pay for our livable world. So let's take a quick look at the economic situation in the 8th Congressional District. So um, we have a lot of different things going on. Uh, I do a presentation specifically for the Iron Range, and I know that you're not quite the Iron Range, but you're kind of on the edge of the Iron Range. And I'm guessing you also have a lot of uh, paper, wood industry here. Is that right? Yep. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> Like I told you before, there is a huge opportunity in northern Minnesota um, with this bill, and this is what we're working on with our elected officials and also just industry leaders and other leaders around us. Um, so we need so um, ten times of what we would need in wind. We have onshore and thirteen times offshore. So what this means is we have more wind than we can ever use if we can uh, harness it. Um, and also biomass, which I would think could be a potentially a big deal around here. If you're looking to sell this idea, um, it, you know, is renewable energy going to be economic in northern Minnesota, in International Falls? And I would say yes, it's, if you look at some of these numbers. Um, and this is all stuff put it together by another Citizens Climate Lobby volunteer named Eric, who lives in Duluth, who's a number whiz, and he has looked at a lot of different industries in northern Minnesota, and what he says is um, he thinks that what's going to happen when this bill happens is that the, the demand for wind is going to go so high um, that the, actually the demand for steel is going to rise dramatically, and it will not it will, it will um, be a great boon for the Iron Range. Also, the demand for biomass. Um, which some people like biomass, some people does, don't, but the fact is biomass will be more in demand with a carbon price. A third factor is that um, right now it's cheaper to take all the iron from the taconite and ship it over to Ohio to be reduced to, to the direct reduced iron. Um, so these coal fire plants um, are only economic because there's no price on carbon. As soon as there is a price on pollution, and you can't just pollute the air for free anymore, it's going to be, make much more sense to actually manufacture steel, or taconite into steel, and also create wind turbines right here, because it just makes a lot more sense. So, what he says is, um, he envisions that we, and, and this is what we're trying to get, like the IRRRB to see this and others, is that um, there will be a very quick economic case for um, manufacturing direct reduced iron right here, turning it into wind turbines, and then using it to supply the wind turbines of Minnesota and North Dakota. It just makes a lot of sense. Uh, and this is more facts from Eric that I don't know if I fully understand, so I maybe shouldn't go into it, but um, I'm even, not oh, even going to. Uh, yes. Can you explain what DRI is? Yes, so DRI is the no, I don't. direct reduced iron, so that's the, um, the preferred process of turning taconite into steel. Thank you. Yeah. And right now it happens all far away. The Iron Range is all, well, not quite. Silver Bay now has a, a small DRI plant. It's considered a great success. But they still mostly just ship all our raw taconite away. Um, and that the possibilities for that are enormous. Because steel is indispensable to a green economy where coal is not. And another area of that is these, um, 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 these, what are they called? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so all it, it, what it would take to um, provide the infrastructure for a green economy is also going to take a lot of steel. So that's good news for northern Minnesotans. So that's where we're at. This is where we could be. Um, Eric also makes the point that it's just not going to make sense um, for our turbines to or what's going to happen with it, the energy grid in the United States is that we are going to start fueling people to the east. And so 
Um, it just makes a lot of sense for us to have turbines in northern Minnesota that will then not only be the energy for us, but heading east to where they're gonna need it anyway. So, must we change? I hope I've convinced you, yes. Can we change? I hope I've convinced you, yes. Will we change? That really is the question, isn't it? We can and we must, and now we will. So, I'm just gonna give a little plug for Citizens Climate Lobby. If you have um, worked as a Democratic citizen in the past, good for you. If you're discouraged about it, I highly encourage you to join this team. I know that for me, it was a huge eye-opener of there are effective and ineffective ways to do our democracy. The main way that we know our democracy will not work is if we don't use it. So that's number one, we need to use our democracy. And second of all, how to use it um, is key. And so just as an example, the type of things we do as Citizens Climate Lobby, we enlist our influencers, like for instance, you see agriculture military. So um, Re uh, Representative Pete Stauber, he's our representative. Um, he has military history, he has hockey history, he has law enforcement history. So that gives us clues as what kind of people we need to influence Stauber. So that's the kind of work we do. He's also a devout Catholic. We also um, <clears throat> work with governments. Well, we work directly with our elected officials, as I said before. We also do a lot of media. I hope that you have at some point read something from Citizens Climate Lobby. We write thousands of letters to editors every year. We get op-eds, we get endorsements from newspapers, um, all kinds of stuff like that. And of course, we do outreach, which is something like what I'm doing right now. But it's really fun, and there is a growing group on the Iron Range. I, up in here, we're so spread out. So if there is enough people, uh, just, you know, I'd say three or four people in International Falls that want to start a group, there are many ways you could do that. But if, if you'd rather do it in the larger group, there is also a sort of a virtual Iron Range group where we meet on Zoom call and by phone. <laughs> and my final thing is to say, so we all have these comfort zones, right? And that's where we spend most of our time. That is not where the magic happens. So if you're wondering, what can I do, uh, especially if there are already many things you do in your personal life to lower your carbon footprint, then what I would say to you is, everybody needs to be doing what you're doing. So how do we get there? And Will Steger says, the answer to climate change is social engagement. And I really believe that is true. So um, I think what we need to be doing most of all, if assuming that you are already doing the things that I've been talking about, uh, lowering your own car carbon footprint, is you need to be engaging with other people about it. We need to be having conversations with friends, relatives, acquaintances, coworkers, um, we, we need to be talking about this all the time to, re to really reflect the major crisis that it is. And this is happening. It's just not happening fast enough. So I hope you will become part of the team and get yourself out of here every now and then and take yourself over to where the magic happens. Thank you. You were very good listeners. That was a whole hour, and that was a long time to sit there. So, are there any questions? Yes. There's back. Okay. Can you? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I understood. With carbon fee, my local electric company has to pay that, right? So they're going to pass that on to me. Ten, twenty, thirty bucks a month. My electric bill will go up, and they'll say. We're just going to keep our plant the same and keep passing the, the higher bills on to the consumer. So, what in this forces them to build windmills, solar farms, etc.? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for putting that up because I didn't. I don't think I made that very clear. So, while so basic economics says that when supply goes up, demand goes down. When supply goes up, down, demand goes up. So um, as 
to see that part of the important thing about a carbon price is that it's steadily rising and it's predictable. And this is, so companies and everyone knows that this is happening. And what that does is that drives innovation in a big way. So um, every, and just to give you a hint of that, when we even, when carbon pricing starts to look like it's getting close, companies are already changing their plans, starting to lower their emissions. Um, there's, I did, there's another slide I put up here, but there's, including a fossil fuel companies, they already have a price on carbon in their budgets. They know it's coming and they're starting to adjust, but they're not gonna necessarily do it until there is a price on carbon. But once there is a price on carbon, then the utilities, you know, they're actually buying their energy from the fossil fuel companies. So the fossil fuel companies, if they wanna stay alive, they're going to start changing their, their, I mean, essentially they already are. Like Shell is ahead. Shell is saying, you know, we're doing this much renewable. And if you go to your utilities, I mean, Minnesota Power will tell you all the things they're doing to adjust to renewables right now. But if there was a price on carbon and they had consumers saying, hey, in Colorado, they're getting their energy for like 10 cents a kilowatt. In Texas, they had a time where they got their energy for free because at night, because they had so much extra wind energy. They just were begging people to plug in at night and plug in their cars and plug in whatever they had. So um, just, a, I, I don't know if I'm explaining it that well, but um, when you have a price signal, it absolutely will change purchases and drive innovation much faster than any regulation can do. And in fact, part of this bill, I also didn't really clarify, this is called the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. It's HR 763, I have information about it in the back for you to take. Um, and, uh, well I lost my train of thought about what I was gonna tell you about that bill, but, um, oh yeah, it also does away with regulation which conservatives love and liberals are very scared about. Um, but the bottom line is that if it does not exceed what regulations would have done in a certain number of years, the regulations can come back. In fact, they're automatically brought back. Um, but that would, that would mean a lot of experts are wrong about what's gonna happen. I think the understanding is it really is gonna do much more than regulation could do. A very long answer to a question. <laughs> yeah. Katya, is it okay if I add a little bit onto that? Please. Um, first, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Carol Arney. Um, I'm from St. Paul, but I grew up here. I uh, grew up in International Falls. I was baptized at uh, Trinity Episcopal Church. Not this one, the wood one no. <laughs> that preceded it. And I have become a climate activist just about a year, not as long as you. But one of the things that uh, people don't realize is that as uh, wind energy and solar energy become cheaper, these power plants, they want to do it the cheapest way possible. That's good business sense. You don't want to pay more when there's a cheaper way available. So coal plants around Minnesota are closing earlier. They're using more and more power. Uh, part of the country I come from has Excel Energy, which is also in Colorado, which is really reaching out for uh, renewable sources. So I don't think it's going to be an increase to a person's personal bill and the power companies can say, oh, I don't care, I'll just collect more money. They want to spend less and they won't stay in business if they spend more. Right, that's, that's the joy of the market economy, is they're gonna get outdone by someone else. And the other thing I forgot to add is you will, uh, there are prices that will go up, I'm convinced of that, but you're gonna also get a check every month as every person will do, and so the influx of cash, particularly for low-income people, is what really is gonna drive this um, spike in the economy that is predicted. Far from the dampening of the economy that, keeps, that used to be predicted about carbon pricing, that it would dampen everything, and now people are really seeing it's actually going to um, explode the economy. There's 11 times more jobs in renewable energy than there is in coal or pipelines. Yes? I'm just curious, when you were talking about the iron range being uh, maybe 
increased with more stuff to do. I have a question about how are they going to manage to create the steel? What energy are they going to be using? Have, has it, I'm, I'm a little ignorant here. Hasn't it been coal that has been the big furnaces that have produced the heat that makes iron happen? I mean, I, I'm all for the yes. electrical wind power, but is, isn't there a, a part of that that's going to cause a lot of trouble? That's just my very good question. question. Yes. And there is an answer on another slide that I don't quite understand by Eric, which shows that, yes, the way it's done now is through these coal blast furnaces, but again, that with a price on carbon and coal disappearing, there are much better ways to do it that will become the norm. And I do want to add, too, I mean, there are, not everyone is thrilled with the idea of a huge um, explosion of demand for iron in this part of the world and um, and copper also incidentally I have to say you know that demand for copper also could increase um, but as well the price of doing business of any kind of manufacturer will also go up because it all involves fossil fuels at this point so you know I don't think we really know how it's going to pan out and I and I think we, the thing to do is to be honest about, um, you know, the economy is going to start shifting in ways that we can't, that I actually could not predict right now, but I'm pretty convinced that the demand for steel is going to go very fast up, and and whether you like that or not, I think that's the reality, and, um, you know, another thing about this act is it doesn't solve every problem. It only solves the greenhouse gas problems. It might create other problems. Um, in the part of the world where I come from, the, the uh, copper nickel mining is a huge issue, and um, when I say the demand for copper might go much higher, you know, that, that could be a problem. And, you know, I just feel like my job is to be honest and to explain what I think might happen, and we'll solve each problem as they come. But for other people, that's good news. They like the idea of more demand for the minerals that we have in northern Minnesota. I think I'm going to wrap it up because um, it's been over an hour and you've been so patient. So I'll just finish by saying there's material in the back. There is postcards for you to write to your elected officials. You can either take it home and write it or you can write one and just um, what we suggest is um, writing to Representative Stauber and telling him that you really believe that climate change is a problem and it needs to be solved quickly in a bipartisan way. And if you think of it, you can you can um, ask that he endorse HR 763, which is this bill that we're talking about. Um, and if you want, you can just leave it there and I will send it for you. Um, we're actually meeting with Representative Stauber on a week from Tuesday. We've met with his staff several times and in typical Citizens Climate Lobby fashion, we've definitely made our inroads and so now we get to meet with the man himself so that's all good news um, there's also um, it says why I act on climate it's a sheet you can take home and put on your fridge that's just for you to determine you know what is driving you here and inspire you hopefully to make change and there's a couple sheets about the energy innovation carbon dividend act those are free to take and there's many copies of my book, which I wrote because I just wanted people in northern Minnesota to start talking about climate change. Um, it's supposed to be a, it's a series of newspaper columns that I wrote over a period of years, just connecting the dots for people that aren't necessarily thinking a lot about climate change. So what is, you know, when our culverts are all crumbling, rather than blame the city council, let's acknowledge this is climate change happening, that kind of thing. It's a non-blaming approach and I don't know if you need to read it, but maybe it's something you can give a relative or a friend that um, maybe is just a little less aware than you. So that's what that book is for, and uh, I think that's all my announcements. Thank you again. So I have a question for all of you before you leave. Is having a monthly meeting such as this worthwhile for the future? Would you think that uh, Invisible would like to continue to support that? If you do, Megan, you have something to say about that? So to say Invisible, we've already started, Joan Christensen, who can't be here tonight, started a global warming committee as part of our Indivisible group where she tries to concentrate on things like water quality and awareness of 
what uh, individual humans can do to impact, or to, you know, make our own impact on stopping global warming. Yeah, can I, that's great. Can I just say, I, I actually forgot to mention too, if you are inspired to become part of a specific climate group here, if you sign up on that Citizens Climate Lobby Sheet, then you will be entered into the data and you will get emails from me, and if there's enough people that sign up, then we'll just start a group and we can do a training and then the national group um, shows you what to do. It really makes it easy to work on climate. And there's groups in Grand Marais, Ely, Two Harbor Sleuth, Bemidji, we're working on Brainerd, and now we're working on International Pulse. So that really would be wonderful if enough people sign up. And I may ask, are there other topics that you would like to explore? Any specific topics? I know we've been here a long time, but it would be helpful for uh, for other people that are promoting this. So if you have some some ideas, pass them on to Megan and and to Jean. Thanks a lot, everybody, for coming, and we really appreciate your support. Yes.